And we're back, Stripe Show Podcast, on a Monday. I'm your host, Travis Fulton. Thank you for making us part of your day. Hope you had a uh, great weekend. Just getting back at it here in the studio on a Monday. You can see behind me a little club fitting action happening. True Spec uh, is in the house. Iron wedge fitting to uh, to start your week. Not a bad way to go. Weather is uh, heating up down here in uh, in Florida. High 80s, low 90s, humidity is here, afternoon storms, it's officially summer uh, in Florida, but I know there's uh, better weather out there uh, in the Midwest, the North, um, that I'll be heading actually on Friday, going up to a little place called uh, Macklemore, just outside of Atlanta, between Atlanta and Chattanooga. I'm going to go up and see my, uh, my buddy, Charlie Reimer, that I used to work with. Uh, at Golf Channel, he's up there, a big part of that property, and uh, going to play uh, play above the clouds. I think that's their um, their tagline. It looks fantastic. I've I've uh, I've got a buddy that went up there and played it, and he was saying, "Man, you got to come up here and check this thing out." They're building another 18, so they're going to have 36 total starting in September. But uh, yeah, I'm heading up there on Friday. Can't wait to see it. 18 holes on Friday. A little dinner, maybe a cigar celebrate with Xander uh, and wake up on Saturday, play another 18. I think they've got a um, kind of like a getaway six holes, like a fun extra six that we're going to play in the afternoon. And then um, maybe get a sneak peek at the new 18 uh, as well. So excited about that um, and get up into the mountains, a little cooler weather. Golf is rolling. Hope you're getting out to swing it a little bit. Online lessons, getting quite a few of those now starting to come in from all over the country, which is exciting. You can work with me. Go to my website, travisfultongolf.com, and uh, you will see lessons. Click on the Lessons tab, online training programs and online capabilities. Getting a lot done long distance, um, which is cool to see that become such a big part of our industry as uh, players get to, or as students, I should say, amateurs and pros get to work with uh, some teachers um, all over the world, all over the uh, all over the country. They don't have to be right there. Uh, on your back door. Hopefully you have a pro right there close to you that you like and go see him and uh, get some time in there on the lesson T. Got a lot to get to today. I'm going to really get into some of the changes that Xander Shoffley has made over the last, I think about six, seven months with Chris Coma. Of course, Chris uh, has been on the podcast many times and I've got it up there right now for those watching on YouTube. And you can see the difference there between Xander on the left from, I think that's 2022, and then Xander on the right most recent. And the biggest difference is that club shaft more down the line, a little less laid off. I'm going to get into some of the advantages there. I, I made a post after he won yesterday. And, I, you know, I talked about how so often, you know, I will make these changes with an amateur player where more times than not, I'm trying to get the, the swing a little bit more complete. I'm trying to get the swing a little bit more down the line, maybe feeling a little more across the line versus shorter and more laid off. Now, there's certainly times for that. There's certainly players you know, that I'm going to work with that maybe are getting a little too deep, uh, maybe are getting a little too across the line, and they start hitting too many push hooks. And so getting them to feel maybe a little shorter, a little higher hands, a little bit more laid off, kind of all a Rory McIlroy. There's some other players that, uh, you know, are going to work on those types of things or like a Max Homa. Um, but more times than not, I think what Xander has done and what a lot of players have done and currently doing, I'm going to show a couple of examples today, I, I think kind of fall more into this category. So I'm going to kind of get into the list of, why that is and some of the benefits i think to what you're seeing xander there uh, more on the right but before we get to that you know i think it's worth noting and giving credit to xander shoffle for some of the decisions that i think he has made with his game let's say over the last uh i don't know six to nine months or six to twelve months it's always Sometimes it's hard to kind of figure out when some of these relationships start and maybe a different change in direction. And of course, Xander has always worked with um, his father, Stefan, who um, was a was a great decathlon. And, um, 
would uh, was was his coach, you know, his, his coach from when he was young all the way up to really just most recently um, last year. And obviously did a very good job um, with Xander. Xander's been a terrific player for a long time, a player who uh, has no weaknesses. And I thought it was interesting listening to Xander uh, in his interview on the live from set talking about how his dad kind of instilled in having no weaknesses and really being a master at each part of of your game like a de, in a decathlon you have these 10 different um you know activities right and and you have to be good at each one of them and so in stealing look you want to be good at all of this let's have no weaknesses and xander i think is really one of a handful of players that really don't have any weaknesses and so we've always known that about xander and his dad's done a really good job i think of getting xander up to this point and Xander, when you look at his game, you know, he's won on the PGA Tour before. We know he's one of the best players in the world. But I think up to this point, Xander, you know, really, I think from a credential standpoint in the amount of wins and you and you match it up to what his skill set is and, and really having no weaknesses, he's probably, I don't know, underachieved to some degree. And maybe that's a little bit critical. But I think, you know, when you look at Xander down the stretch and some of the difficult that he has had in closing out tournaments i mean he's been there time and time again and the question was could he get it done late on a sunday and on sunday he did in kentucky in valhalla he made those big putts and i made a post on monday and i posted xander and i just simply said you know look at some point xander is going to make some big putts on Sunday, right? It just has to happen. He's too good. I mean, you're just going to keep putting yourself in that situation. And at some point, you're going to make some putts. And he did. And that was the difference. And you saw it on the front nine there. He, need, he needed to make a couple critical par putts. He had the one that bounced through the fringe there, came up short, but he came back and made the next one. Uh, he made some big putts on the back nine and none bigger than the five-footer to win it all on the 72nd hole. So kudos to him going through the experiences that he has had and and now capitalizing and winning his first major championship and holding up the Wanamaker Trophy. But I think this journey up to this point really kind of goes back a little bit. You know, I talked about at the beginning of the year with Xander, with Keith Stewart, who joined me tomorrow as we break down the tournament. You know, both of us were kind of down on him. Like, we didn't really like what we were seeing from Xander so much on, on the golf course. And really, I think more than what we were hearing off the golf course. Um, you know, I'm not sure if, if his dad a little bit, maybe kind of became a little bit of a distraction. There was the Ryder cup situation where you, you saw Xander and, and Patrick were kind of in their own little silo and, you know, wanting to get paid and all of that riff raft. And, and so I, I think there might've been, a situation there where, you know, with Xander, I think the influences that he was having maybe weren't coming across the best way, right? Maybe the intentions were good, but Xander necessarily wasn't, um, I don't think, moving in the right direction as a result of that. I thought he played kind of both sides of the fence from a PGA Tour Live standpoint. And he just kind of added all up, the Ryder Cup and some of his interviews, PGA Tour Live and all this and and the smoke a little bit around his dad, and I think can be a little difficult to, to deal with. It just didn't feel right at the end of last year. It just didn't feel right with Xander. And as a result, coming into this season, I was just like, man, you know, it's just, I mean, this ain't it. But I do think since his dad hasn't been out there as much, kind of the arm's length there with his dad, don't get me wrong, I think his dad's done a good job with Xander, but I do think that it's kind of gotten to the point where something had to happen. There had to be a change in direction, you know, not only maybe just kind of off his attitude off the course, but also with what he was doing from a technical side and having a different set of eyes. And in, in here comes Chris Como, who's done a really good job with him. And I think as a result in Chris's influence, and you can see some of the changes that is, he has made at the top, he's gotten longer, but more than all that, I think just Xander and his attitude and his interviews, just, it just, to me, it's checking all the boxes again. It just sounds right. He he, he sounds a little bit more humble. He sounds um, a little bit uh, perhaps maybe more hungry. 
You know, I don't think like Xander's just like got this dog barking out of him down the stretch and he wants to step on your throat like we see with Scotty Scheffler, like we've seen with Tiger Woods, like we've seen with some other players. But I do think we've seen some real growth here with Xander. And and maybe it's a coincidence, maybe it isn't. But I do think a lot of it started with with his dad kind of letting Xander run a little bit more on his own. I think insert Chris Como to take over some of the technical side. And I think as a result of that, that growth really over the six, seven, eight months, I can hear it in his voice, see it in his attitude. You can see it in the way that he plays. And certainly down the stretch on Sunday, he made the big putt. So kudos to him. I give him a lot of credit. I give his dad credit for stepping away. Um, I give Chris Como a lot of credit. And uh, Xander Shoffley's got his first major championship win. And I think it's safe to say, so, you know, look, it's always, it's always easy to go down that path of like, he's going to win more. He's going to win a lot more. I think it's safe to say that Xander's going to win more tournaments. And I feel comfortable saying that, yeah, I think he'll, I think he'll clip off another major. I do because he's got no weaknesses. And I tell you in today's game, there's not many of them, you know, there's not many of them that, um, represent uh, no weaknesses. I also think before we get to Xander's swing, you got to give credit to Bryson. Bryson DeChambeau um, put on a great show. It was fun to watch him on the big stage. He's an entertainer. And I think like Xander, you've seen a lot of growth from Bryson, um, both off the course and on the golf course. Uh, he doesn't. He, he looks like he's not just trying to hit it as far as he can and beef up and, and you know, be that guy. But he's got speed. He knows how to work it. His, I think his iron game uh, is crisp. His wedge game's gotten better. Short game. He's one of the best putters in the world always. And so I think the work that he's done with uh, Dana Dahlquist, you remember, you know, Bryson used to work with Chris, and Chris kind of helped him through that journey of hitting in the long ways. He won the U.S. Open. And, and then now Bryson has been with Dana Dahlquist for a while, and I think that's been a good match. And, um, and you've seen some growth there. And, and you certainly can hear it in Bryson in the interview as well. Um, there's 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 a there's a real maturity happening there, both on and off the golf course with Bryson DeChambeau, and he put on a great show. Who who would have ever thought that, you know, Bryson going to live and taking money from from the Saudis, and he's gotten more popular on the PGA Tour. He's gotten more popular with uh, you know that crowd. <laughs> but <laughs> but that's that's where I think we're at. So look, it was it was um, unfortunate the way the week started on Thursday. Certainly. Um, a, a death and, the, and and just how bizarre it was with Scotty Scheffler, the weather, the course played soft. It played easy record setting 64, 65. I mean, you name it, but I think in the end uh, on Sunday, it was a great show. It was great theater, a couple big names down the stretch, Victor Hovland back with Joe Mayo doing some good things. He was there. Love seeing Vic back up there. Yeah, good stuff. I I, I like the way um, all of it played out, and I was really happy. Trust me, I was really happy for Xander to get his first win. All right, so let's get into it. Here's here's um, Xander's swing from a couple years ago, and and you'll see. Look at the top of the swing here, like that club. You know, doesn't get all the way parallel. Doesn't really kind of get all the way complete. And this is a driver. And, and the shaft can kind of hang to the left. And look, if that's, you know, and you got to take the camera angles into consideration. I appreciate, and, and again, I appreciate the camera angle police out there in social media. Anytime I post a comparison of any way, there's always one or two that are, ah, you know, that can't, bah, 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 you know, you can't, that camera angle's a little here, is a little there. Well, look, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and f I feel comfortable with my position on what these guys are working on, even though if the camera angle isn't exactly to the millimeter of height and placement. So you look at Xander here, um, you know, that, that club head well left of the hands. Is that technically laid off? It's close, right? It, it's, it's very close, but it's certainly pointing more left than say this one. You know, you look at that swing there and you can see that club definitely more across the line and, and i'm sure feels across the line right feels across the line across the line is when the shaft is pointing more to the right looking down the target line the shaft would be pointing more to the right and you can see that shaft really 
if it is, it's very, very subtle, but it's certainly more across the line than that of the left. And there's a comparison. You can see that's a good image. Now, the camera angles, again, might be a little skewed, so it might be fudging a little bit. But trust me, Xander Shoffley has got the club more down the line or across the line, however you want to label it, than he does here on the left. And that he had, I think, in years past before he started working with Chris. And, and, and Xander kind of talked about this. Look, he said the changes have been kind of subtle. But I think this is a good change. I think this is kind of a safe change uh, in many ways for Xander. And I think it's it's a kind of a safe direction and change for many amateurs. I get the club more across the line feeling for most amateurs more so than I'm going to get it laid off. And that doesn't mean I don't have students where it's the other way around. But generally speaking, more times than not, I'm trying to make the backswing a little bit more complete and or get the club pointing more down the line or what feels like a little bit more across the line. And you look at some of the benefits of this, and I think the first one is, the first one is, is that when you do this, you're going to make a little bit more of a complete turn. Oftentimes, when when the arms maybe want to go up and the shaft gets a little laid off, like the turn can get a little short. The turn can get a little incomplete. We can get a little quick with it uh, as far as the backswing. When you look at this picture on the right, and if you get that club turned a little bit more down the line, like you're going to make, generally speaking, a better turn. Like that left shoulder is going to get behind the ball more. That right hip's going to turn a little bit deeper. And I, and I can see that with Xander. I, I think he's a little bit bigger. He's a little bit stronger. I think he would contribute some of the speed gains that he's made to his fitness. Um, but I do think in Xander's case, like he is making more of a complete turn. Shoulder turn, hip turn. I kind of like the checkpoint of the left shoulder back behind the golf ball. Right shoulder peeling back behind the head right hip turning back, left knee pointing behind the ball, like getting that more complete turn. And if you took a club right now and you just took it up to the top and you and you just said, okay, I'm going to get the club up to the top and I'm going to lay the club off. I'm going to point it well left of my hands from this target line view. And then just take the club and turn it more to the right, get it more down the line or across the line. You're going to feel yourself wanting to turn more in order to accommodate where that club is pointing. Okay, so I think you make a better turn. The second thing is, and, and a better turn, by the way, is going to give you more speed, right? And so that speed element plays huge, not only for Xander Shoffley, but for an amateur golfer. The second is, I think it gives you a little bit more time. Like when you make that more complete turn, I think you're, you're, you're kind of less likely maybe to rush the backswing, get quick with the backswing. Um. And so I think it kind of gives you maybe a little bit more of this deliberate feel in the backswing where you get more time to complete the turn, get more loaded into the trail side. And then from there, you have more time coming down to shift and turn and, and do the things that you want to do. So I think there's this element of speed, but I also think there's this element of time in the swing that I think go very well together very well together in particularly, now let me tell you this, in particularly with the driver. And I want to show you another example here. Okay, I want to show you another example right here. Sahith Thagala. Here's another one. I mean, it almost looks exactly the same. Look at Sahith on, on the left. Club pointing well to the left. The hand, or the club head well left of the hands. Look at the one on the right. Club head's a little to the right of the hands. Now, again, I, I know camera angle police. It's probably not ideal. But trust me, that's there's a difference there and where that club is pointing and what that means to that turn and what that means to the idea of time in the swing. And I think when you put those two together, it bodes very well with the driver. Very well with the driver. And how about these stats this week for Xander Shoffley? 310 yards off the tee. That's 15th in the field driving distance, and then you look at accuracy, 73.21. That's 41 of 56 fairways. That's T for 16. That's long, and that's accurate. Okay? And, and, I, and I'm telling you, these changes with an amateur player in getting them 
to kind of go down this path so many times, so many times, puts the wheels in motion for development through the bag, but in particularly improving the driver swing. Okay, so I think that's, I think that's, you know, I think that's a good starting point for this. Here's another example of that I think has made these changes. This is Daniel Berger. Look at those difference. I mean, Daniel up top there, that shaft, I mean, that is laid off. Pointing way left. Now look at it on the bottom and you can see definitely, you know, certainly not across the line, but certainly more down the line, right? And so there's another guy that has made some of these changes. Ricky Fowler went down this, this path a little bit. And I think it's it's a little more interesting with Ricky because Ricky's always been a player that had the shaft laid off and then maybe steepened it a little in transition. And he was a great player in college, a great player when he came out, won the players, and all those things, and then decided to kind of, you know, make some of those changes. And that was going to change his downswing and impact and all those things very differently than how he played up to that point. And so I think in, in that example, maybe a little more risk when it comes to making some of those changes, and he certainly did that. I can tell you Jordan Spieth's another one. Jordan Spieth, in his heyday, was not laid off. And, and he was more down the line. I think through the chase of speed or whatever, uh, he started getting more laid off. And so he's really worked hard. And you remember that exaggerated feel where he was trying to point the club way to the right. And, and so he's been trying to get the club more down. You know, so these guys, you know, a lot of these guys, um, you know, it's all relative. But these changes in making this backswing more complete and the club more down the line um, is very real on the PGA Tour. And I can promise you it's very real in the amateur game. And I do it all the time right here in this studio lengthening players out getting the club more down the line or across the line and getting that club face uh prepared so speed um you know the fuller backsman gives you speed the fuller backsman gives you more time which i think leads to accuracy um i i think some of the things some of the other values here as we talk about now the net effect coming down and i'm going to go ahead and put xander swing back up here but I think with Xander, when he would, like a better player sometimes when they get a little short and the club gets a little laid off, the club can kind of work a little bit more underneath them. Not always, but it can get a little bit more kind of underneath coming down. The path can get a little too far out to the right. They can hit some blocks. They can feel like they've got to do more with the face to get it around. The dynamic loft can struggle a little bit. And so they can get kind of trapped underneath a little bit, I think, with Xander. It really depends, like, on the downswing pattern. But I think in Xander's case, he would get a little trapped underneath. Now you look at some of the, you know, this this newer swing, and, and, and with the club a little bit more down the line, a little more complete turn, I think he's got a little bit more time to get the club back down in front of him a little bit more, and it just really looks like he can just kind of unleash it you know, and just let it go from there. So it's almost like, you know, he gets the club in a good spot going back, and then from there he can just unleash it. And so I think for the better player, they, they can get it laid off, but they keep it kind of pitched back behind them enough, and then they can turn and hit it. And sometimes, you know, I think the air, can, they can get a little bit underneath it. Now, I think for the amateur in the, in the, in the let's say, the higher handicap, what I see is they will get it up there laid off and then they will steepen it in transition. And when that shaft steepens in transition, that club head's getting on top of the hands early. And then from there, as they turn and hit it, they can clank it on the toe. And, and so as that ball starts to roam around on the face and they start hitting it out on the toe, then they start doing, they start compensating through impact where the pivotal stall, the handle will, will raise to keep it off the toe and now they can hit it out to the right. And so there's this compensation happening as a result of getting the shaft steep. And so it can be a tricky situation depending upon, I think oftentimes the skill set of the player and how the pivot works and those types of things, better player, keep it pitched back, maybe get it a little underneath higher handicap. It steepens, which you know that I, you know, 
I just think for the journey of a higher handicap, middle handicap, even low handicap, like that can, I think that can really, you know, lower your ceiling because the ball can roam around in the face and then you got to compensate. And so, so often I, I, you know, in the studio, I'm going to give you an example here. So often in the studio by, by shaping the backswing better and making it more complete and making it feel a little bit more across the line, what happens with the amateur is the downswing improves on its own. And, sh and uh, Shaheen Naktavani and I, we, we talked about this just a few weeks ago on the podcast. And so here's a great example. Here's this guy here, um, you know, probably around a 10 handicap, maybe a, he's not nice. I think he's like a six or seven handicap. Um, and so you look at the, you look at the old swing up top, right? And you look at that position at the top and it's, it's really not bad, but what, but what happened here when you, this, this position up top, the second picture over from the left, like you look at that, it's like, okay, the shaft looks pretty good, doesn't it? But his right elbow is kind of retracted behind him a little bit and his spine's leaning a little too far to the left and his hip would kick out and sway. And then from there, he would just steepen it. Like he would just, you can see the shaft coming down. Now it's in between the forearms and then he would hit it on the toe. And he actually managed it pretty well through the strike based off of that. And so you look at the bottom, what I did is we, I got him to feel like, okay, look, the shaft's a little bit more across the line. And so now you can see the shaft's clearly pointing more to the right. And as he did that, you could start seeing him turn his right hip better. As he started turning his right hip better, I, I could get his spine to feel like he's in a little more flexion to the right. And all these little things were happening to accommodate the difference in the shaft. And so as he did that on the downswing, and I never even suggested a thing on the downswing. Look at the difference in the bottom of the shaft pitch back on the right form. And you know what ball, and you know what shot shape he started to hit? A draw. And so you start thinking about an amateur player and how many can draw it. Not many, right? And I, and, I, and I believe, I really believe this as a player gets into golf and through this journey, like learning how to hit a draw at some point, I think is critical in the development of a player. Most players get in the game, you know, mid to high handicaps, clanking on the toe. Um, they can hit some pulls. They hit slices. That could get more predominant as the swing gets longer. And so you get in there and you start shaping this, this backswing as I did at the bottom. And all of a sudden now the shaft pitches back, the ball gets more in the center of the face. They start hitting shots that start to the right and draw. And you know what the biggest thing ab above all this is, is that guy on the right, when we went to the driver, we just talked about the driver setup. He did the same thing. He was doing the same thing with his driver. So not only is this good with an iron, but I just think it's absolute cash with the driver in the journey of many, many amateurs. Okay. So this is just one example. Here's another one. This is a guy that plays in the NFL. His name is Evan Ingram. And uh, just a freak tied in, fantastic dude. Just started about a year and a half ago. Came in here and kind of had a shorter backswing. He's a big, strong athlete, can really muscle it out there, but really never hit a draw in his life. And so I talked about the setup, got the ball forward, got the hands back, got him tilted, got him feeling a little bit closed. And then from there, I, you know, we worked on, we worked on getting nice full turn and he felt like the club was pointing more to the right. And if you look at this, it's just right down the line. All right. So watch this. It's just right down the line. I can't stop it right on the button, but we never talked about his downswing one time, not once set up, shape the backswing. Club felt a little more to the right. All of a sudden, he's making a nice full turn. All of a sudden, his left arm has got some depth. And you know what shot, shot shape he hit from here? A draw. <laughs> and so, look, when you're developing amateurs, like this is, like they walk out of here and they're like, wow, look how much better my backswing was. Oh, my God, look at my downswing. It's much better. Look at my impact condition. My left arm's not a chicken wing anymore. Look at, I'm releasing it. The club is exiting good. All these check marks because of this, of, of really kind of a similar change from what we've done with Xander. Now, I don't think the checklist is that long with Xander as it would be the benefit for an amateur. But I think, you know, we share kind of the same journey and why, um, 
it's generally speaking, generally speaking, more conducive to kind of, and I think more relatable for an amateur player to what you see with Xander Shoffley, for what you see with Sahith Thagala, for what you see with Jordan Spieth, for what you see with Daniel Berger, guys that are, you know, doing these kinds of things. And so those are, you know, look, those are, those are some of the benefits, I think. And I mentioned, you know, I mentioned the lead arm depth, right? I'm going to go back to the student here and the lead arm depth and that lead arm kind of getting a little bit more around the body. And so I want to finish with this here with, with the lead arm depth and kind of some of the feels that you, you, you may come across to get the club pointing more down the run, more down the line. One of them that 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 I like is is taking I'm a right so I'm a right-handed player taking the right hand the palm and as you turn to the top feeling the palm kind of rotate Let's see if you can see that here let me so I would so if I'm here I'm a turn in 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 my palm kind of rotating away from me I'm, I'm making my palm look away from me as I turn to the top and so when I when I when I swivel my wrist like that, that's going to get the shaft to kind of turn and point a little bit more across the line. You can also do it with the elbow, like the elbow can kick out a little bit. Um, you know, I'm okay with that some initially, but I do think I do think if if I can keep the right elbow, you know, and not get it so retracted behind the player, but the right elbow, you know, pinching the left. A little bit as the right wrist is turning tends to help get the right elbow back out in front of the hip coming down but look it's okay for the elbow to kick out a little bit the shoulder to feel a little more internal rotation and then you know and then kind of back the other way right coming down so it looks you know, like here and then back in that way um, i think more times than not you'll see the you know kind of turning the shaft maybe a little more with the right wrist and then the right elbow not getting too far behind in this case i let i let this player's elbow kind of drift a little more than you know to my liking but I, but i wanted him to get the shaft over there and so i kind of let the elbow go and then as we've worked on this i've slowly brought the right elbow back a little bit but still achieving somewhat of the feel of the shaft and just incrementally the shaft has you know kind of gotten a little more down the line but i wanted you to see the difference the net effect to the downswing just by doing that. And so I think the right wrist is, is, is kind of a cool field. Oftentimes, um, and, and these are just some of the things that have been successful for me in my studio through trial and error of 24 years. The other thing is you can go to the left hand and feel the back of the left hand kind of turning away from you. So the back of the left hand looking away from you. Um, almost like a reverse roll of the of the left form. Again, Shaheen talked, we, we talked about that. Victor Hovland would be kind of a player that comes to mind that, you know, makes that turn. And it almost looks like he's taking the back of his left hand and he's rotating the back of the left hand away from him. And then his right wrist is turning away from him. So you almost get this reverse roll of the forearm. Well, what's going to happen from there when you change direction? It's going to go back the other way. Right, so the shaft's going to want to then pitch back behind you and transition, and that's what happens so many times. I can't even tell you over the years how many times that happens. And so, to me, when, when we start talking about the benefit of this this list of benefits for what we've seen with Xander and how it applies to the amateur player, well, if if I can get the shaft to to pitch back and transition on its own, well, that's huge, right? For an amateur, that's huge. And so the way that, you know, we're shaping that in the backswing through the wrist angles, a little bit of the elbow, um, you know, you'll feel maybe some orientation in the shoulders and the hips. I think for Xander, I think his left shoulder is a little bit lower. When you, when you start turning that shaft more to the right and more across the line, you'll feel not only the need to turn, but you also feel like that left shoulder has got to stay a little bit lower than the right. And so you're working on that inclination of the right side higher than the left. And that's, again, fantastic. You don't get that runaway, right, where that left shoulder wants to pop up and then the left arm kind of runs away and the hands want to elevate and then the shaft starts to tip back. 
you start cleaning that up with a better turn, shaft more down the line, wrist angles, um, I don't, you know, maybe a little more superior for the amateur player to develop that shaft pitching back in transition. I've got more speed to work with. I've got more time to work with. All of those things, I'm telling you, they add up. And not only do they help the best players in the world like Xander, but they elevate the ceiling of the amateur player so much. And that's what I wanted to share today uh, on the podcast. So I hope you enjoyed that. Kind of all things Xander Schaff, a little bit about his swing. Congratulations, Xander. Major, major props to him on um, not just winning the PGA, but I think making perhaps some, some difficult choices. I'm not in the Xander camp. I'm just from my observation on the outside. Some, some uh, I'm sure some, some hard decisions in there. Maybe revamping some things both on and off the golf course. I like it. Uh, I, I've liked it now for the last month. And I think he's got more wins on the horizon. Congratulations, to Bryson, for the very same reasons. And I'll finish with this, Victor Hovland. If you leave Joe Mayo in the near future, I'm going to hunt you down myself. <laughs> it's good to see him back with uh, Joe and playing well again. All right, guys. Stripe Show Podcast. We'll be back tomorrow. All things Charles Schwab. I know uh, that course very, very well. My man, Keith, he'll be back. Don't miss it.